So let me start with a quick intro about myself. My name is uh, Ethan Ferdosi, and I'm a senior solution architect with AWS. I joined AWS about uh, 18 months ago. Uh, for those of you who might have heard my previous talk um, on month June, uh, you know about me, but basically uh, I've majority of my experiences over the past 20 years have been on application development and focusing on .NET in, in, in particular. And uh, since I joined AWS, uh, I'm closely working with AWS partners, helping them with migrating all of these them, uh, their Microsoft workloads and moder modernizing from uh, on-prem to uh, containers, serverless, and any, any other type of uh, cloud native applications. So today, talk would be uh, around serverless, um, uh, but uh, just to just to set the expectation, this is would be uh, this would be an uh, introductory call, um, and I'm gonna go to level 200, a bit to 300, uh, covering some software uh, architecture patterns, uh, the changes uh, that have been introduced to the, to the Lambda and serverless, which are core components of serverless is Lambda. And then hopefully by the end of the session, you will have a clear idea about different options that are available uh, in AWS Lambda, how you can architect your application, how you can start and put a sub your application using AWS Lambda. So hopefully um, you you get uh, some good takeaways from this session. So with that, uh, let's begin and uh, run back to your questions. I hope that I can answer some of those questions regarding to the pricing and definitely uh, the benefits that uh, everyone can get from serverless architecture. All right. So let me let me start with the hardware evolution and see uh, over the past uh, decades what have been changed and why we think that we can now uh, using serverless because definitely the, the hardware behind this uh, software architecture is something that we are dependent on and that's what has enabled us to be able to go with this um, uh, serverless architecture. So. The computing uh, um, has gone through several key phases um, uh, of, of evolution, and each of them has uh, significantly shaped the way that the software is created and deployed and the ecosystem around it. Uh, physical servers and data centers, we all remember that, and there is still there, uh, used to be the only way that you could deploy and run your software on a, on a larger scale. But we made this more efficient with virtualization when um, that started, many of the against many, many same basics, but hardware-driven limitations still remain because we are still running on the on-prem. But moving to the cloud helped us to uh, free from the physical limitation, but we still had a lot of work to do to build and scale large software projects. Here are a few advantages of the virtual servers in the cloud. As you can see, um, obviously, you can recover qu faster from the disaster. Uh, it's it's much faster for, for the customers to be able to uh, innovate and use and provision the, the instances or any kind of infrastructure that they need. The resources are elastic now. Um, and as Ron mentioned, the trading capex for OPEX. And this is a very important part of moving to the cloud because instead of spending all of the money to buy the infrastructure and hardware, you're now just spending for what you're using. And you don't need to worry about any kind of maintenance or uh, managing the infrastructure or buying hardware that over a course of two or three years, they might get obsolete and they're not, you need to upgrade them anymore. So these are the advantages of uh, uh, moving to the cloud. Now, what is a seal there is that by moving to the, cloud, to, to the cloud, you're not necessarily removing all of the dependence into the hardware because you still need to administrate your virtual servers. You still need to think about how much CPU and memory or your application requires to be able to manage the capacity. Uh, the size of the workload is important, how, how your application would be available through different regions or to different parts of the world, and uh, if it's fault tolerance or not. And this is where you switch into the virtual server in the cloud, which we found uh, many of our customers are currently, that's, that's actually the starting point for them. That's where they want to start to uh, move to the cloud to, be of, uh, to get a bit of taste of what they can do, what they cannot do on, in the cloud. But what is important here is uh, serverless has changed many things in this, in this area. Uh, basically, all of these needs are gone and uh, means that you don't need to think about service, no, no, nothing about infrastructure or, or high availability or, or uh, how you can scale up or scale down based on your application needs. And that's where you can see the most benefits. You see how much time and effort and, and money you can save by moving to the serverless. 
that's why we are covering a lot and, and, and more deeper into the uh, serverless. Um, and that's why I call it build and run application without thinking about servers, because we know that uh, in serverless, there are really uh, servers behind the scene. But what is important is that as, as, a, as an end, end user, we don't see those servers. I mean, we don't uh, need to care about what is behind the scene. So understanding what has been changed, how hardware is uh, helping us in that um, journey, let's, let's quickly look at the software architectures um, and see how we can um, glue these two together. Um, this is a typical monolithic architecture. You've had a million, million of times. Um, the typical application has a user interface, business logic, and data store behind it. And this is got, um, usually is deployed to our, to, to our productions using a kind of may, maybe one single component or several physical components as a DLL or exec files or dependencies that they have, um, which combine the user interface and business logic, or they might have been separated. But the fact about this monolithic architecture is that and regardless of that, it's very hard to scale because um, if, if one part of the application is down or it needs to be a scale up, then the whole application needs to be go up. So this is, uh, there are some disadvantages for that, of course. Um, it is very hard to be able to iterate fast. Um, the reason for that is that for any single change in one part of the application, the whole thing needs to be retested and redeployed again. And the CI CD time uh, is, not, is not very efficient because uh, you know, the, the going through the full uh, life cycle of uh, software development is, is not a, it's not something easy. And, and of course, there are issues that I'm sure that all of you are familiar with that. Now, when Microsoft microservice architecture has been introduced by breaking down the application into smaller pieces of services or APIs, uh, which are connecting to each other through a very lightweight uh, protocol, which we call it usually as HTTP, um, that's where uh, we see lots of things have been changed. And now we can start to uh, think about other options which are available for our software development. Uh, the, the picture here shows that uh, when we're talking about microservices, it's basically you're breaking that application into different business logics and each service covering one, one single area of the functionality and it, it has um, its own uh, user interface and its own data store. Uh, there are debates around, shall we use one data store or many, but the fact is um, uh, isolating data stores of each individual service from each other, that's where um, you can actually isolate it, um, each individual service. And so um, if service requires to be, um, requires to access to another data store, which just belong to another service, they usually go through the services. So this is very high level about microservices. I know that there are different patterns for the microservices frameworks, but this is not what we're going to cover today. It's just about understanding how monolithic can be changed to microservices. Now, again, the benefits of the microservices um, is very easy to scale because uh, assuming that you have an application that in one part the, the users are entering the data into the system and another part you're running a report. So imagine that your, your report might take 15 minutes or 20 minutes to complete. Uh, at the same time, the whole, the whole application would be down and no one would be able to enter the data and everything would just slow down. But breaking down into microservices, you can imagine if there are two separate services, you can scale up your reporting um, service uh, independent of any other part of the application. And, and definitely that would save a lot on, on um, errors because uh, if, if one, again, one, one part is failing, it doesn't have any impact on other parts. So now, with that software architecture and hardware, which has been uh, changed over the past years, um, how we can combine them together to be able to get to the point that we can deliver a very um, high, highly available and faltering application? Well, um, we can start with the Lambda, which I'm going to cover in a few um, slides. But uh, if you have a monolithic application and you want to deploy to the AWS serverless or any other serverless architecture, in fact, imagine that you have a web application. And your web application had different uh, webs like, uh, or different endpoints. Uh, for instance, that's a pedestal store um, that you can get, put, delete, post, or any kind of uh, HTTP webs. Those incoming requests can all be combined and consolidated into one single Lambda. So it means that you are deploying your application or your web application into one big single function. 
this is yes of course this is sounds uh not great because uh we would say that, okay nothing nothing's going to change here but of course there are some benefits into that it is um it's much easier to to debug and and understand a less distributed system and of course uh, the the deployments could be done faster but in contrast there there is only one single handler that's going to handle all of the incoming requests um, the routing mechanism, how you want to write those incoming requests to the Lambda and different uh, part of the Lambda function, that needs to be built. There, there needs to be a routing system. Uh, similar problem for, for a scaling like a monolithic application. But believe me or not, this is a still and the starting points for for majority of the use cases as we are seeing when customers wanted to just move to the cloud to be able to understand the lambda that can be an option but this is definitely a not it's not a long-term solution how can we make this better well first we need to break down our monolithic to the microservice architecture and by doing it then when that's where we can start to uh, send individual requests to different Lambda functions. So in this solution, we have one Lambda per HTTP method. And this is basically the key to design your application. Uh, if, if you have a big fat application, you might, you might wonder that where I should start by uh, to, with thousands of functions that I have or classes that I have in my code, where should I start? Basically, that can be an, an option for that. So we, we, we're going to, um, for instance, using the Strangler pattern, we can come up with uh, one part of, a, part of the application, get one Lambda function, and then uh, uh, each HTTP method or function can be routed to one Lambda. It's easier for team to, to work together. Um, uh, as a, as a software architecture pattern, there's a separation of concern and separation of components here. You have fine-grained deployments. Each service can be deployed individually, and it's much easier to debug. And of course, um, if you are um, your team is agile and you're following any kind of agile practices, that's exactly um, what it can help you. So. We talked about Lambda. What is Lambda? And uh, I believe that that's the core um, part of our discussion today. Uh, Lambda, as you might know, is uh, allow you to run the code without any provisioning or managing service. Lambda is the core of AWS serverless. In Lambda, you pay only for the computing time you consume. With Lambda, you can run code for virtually any type of application or backend service, regardless of the uh, language or the uh, runtime that you are using. And all, all you need is to just upload your code to the Lambda, and it will take care of everything required to run and scale your code with high availability. Uh, Lambda, uh, which is uh, is basically a compute service, and is and it requires the RAM and CPU to be able to execute the code. No administration is required. It can automatically scale up um, and is available and fault tolerance built in. Uh, and as you can see here, the, the run times which are supported now is those languages from .NET to Go, Java, or Node.js. Um, depends on the popularity of, of the uh, progr programming languages. Uh, we, we've seen the Python is at the top. Um, and for instance, .NET is the uh, number five or number six in the list. But if you have any language which is not supported, you can still go and create your own custom runtime to run your application on top of it. What is important about Lambda, as I mentioned, is that you never pay for idle time. Um, this is a this is a very this is a ten thousand feet view of uh, Lambda architecture. Uh, Lambda is event driven. I saw a question in the chat window before, but. Uh, that's basically the answer to that question. The Lambda is event driven. Uh, you you um, you bind this uh, your Lambda uh, to to any kind of event that I'm going to cover in a few slides shortly, uh, and those would trigger your function. Your function would execute, and as soon as it finishes, the the, the Lambda function or the Lambda instance would be terminated, um, and then depends on how much time you've, your, your, your function has, has taken, uh, you would be charged for that. So you pay only by the usage. Now, lambdas, uh, there are different concepts around it that we need to understand. First thing is the versions. Um, you can deploy uh, multiple versions of your functions. And that's very important for those of you who have a de development background. You understand that if you have a function that you Built and deployed, and you realize that ah, there is something wrong with it. You can quickly 
deploy another one. And it, if, if the previous one actually was correct, then you can roll back to that. These are the options the Lambda gives us by keeping uh, several versions of one function. And, and that version includes the configuration as well. So we have a uh, alias as well, which is the mutable pointers to the versions. Uh, on, the, on the pictures here, uh, you see that uh, the dev instance is actually uh, your Lambda function, dev alias, uh, which your code is anywhere in your configuration, you're pointing to that dev, uh, is pointing to the latest version. And that keeps your development process uh, smooth and easy. You just build and deploy and test. You don't need to change anything in the configuration. But at, at some stage, one of your versions might get to the point that is ready for, the, for to go into the production or staging first. Then that's where you kind of start to create different alias, which is only pointing to the specific version. And here, the production is pointing to version, as an example, one to three, which means um, uh, regardless of what's, what's been happening in development, the production is always different. So that enables us to be able to roll back uh, or stage promotion or even uh, locked behavior, uh, which, is, which is very um, common when using the lambdas. Very um, important and of course interesting thing about Lambda uh, is having layers. So layers in Lambda means that it's very similar to the um, components and libraries that you've previously have done with, uh, with, with different languages. For instance, uh, you might have several DLLs that have the uh, core functionality wrapped up in, in DLL and sharing between different projects. That's where you kind of start to do your Lambda layers. Each layer have, um, can, have multiple, can, can be built on top of each other and, and use the uh, previous layer. Uh, and finally, uh, you can configure your system runtime as part of this layer as well. So uh, there are several benefits into that. Um, you, can, uh, you can have the built-in support uh, for, for, for secure sharing by this ec ecosystem. Uh, it actually promotes the separation of responsibilities and let the developers to be able to iterate faster on writing business logics. And your layer can be anything. Um, it can be your the training data. For instance, you have the mock data for application to test or have you have the configuration files. They can be built into la layers. And that makes your final Lambda function, which is actually the core of your business logic, it makes it very lightweight and small because everything else has been done in, in different layers. It up to the architecture of the application, how you want it to structure it. But this, this layering is available there for, for developers to use. In terms of the security, um, there are different methods that you can set up for, yeah, for Lambda. First of all, you can leave it open. Um, no authentication or authorization. Anyone can access your Lambda function uh, within the AWS services or even from the outside or you can uh, switch to the IAM permissions uh, from AWS. Uh, depend on, depends on the policies and credentials to be able to grant access. For instance, you might say, if, if uh, my, my S3 bucket is able to access this specific uh, Lambda functions, but instead, uh, for instance, uh, my SQS is not able to access any other thing. So there are different, different combinations that you can make out of that. Then if you have a user directory, you have users who are logging to the system and you want to set, set uh, access control for them, uh, you can use the uh, Amazon uh, Cognito. Or, and finally, you have the Lambda authorizers, which is uh, very common and most common, honestly, uh, when you have the auth token, which is JWT token, and you have a bear token that you wanted to validate through the HTTP header or the body of, the, of your request, which is coming in. So different methods available there uh, based on the use case, we can pick any of that. Now, in terms of uh, pricing, um, you have this option to be able to select a memory for your Lambda when you're defining it. And you say how much memory I need, and then based on that memory, uh, which is the power of your function, um, if you increase it gradually, let's say you, you've initially passed, uh, you pick um, uh, 500 meg and then you will, you will increase it, then AWS will proportionally increase the number of virtual CPUs and networking bandwidth allocated with that function. Now the question here is that, okay, if I run my Lambda with lower memory, it would cost less. less. Um, the answer is uh, definitely not always. Um, Sometimes, yes, but sometimes not. So what we call is that there is a 
there is a there is a, a diagram and there is a chart which shows the the peak that you you're setting your memory and tuning up. Then you get into the spot that we call it the sweet spot, and that's basically where your the, the combination or the balance between the memory and the CPU uh, is is in is in the best spot, and that's where you can get the most value from your function by running it not only fast, also uh, paying the list. Now there are some stages that if you uh, add more memory. Uh, it costs you more. So it really depends on how long your function is running because the duration of the Lambda, which is to, from the time that your code being executing until it returns or otherwise terminates for any errors, it will run it up to the nearest 100 milliseconds and that's where you will get calculated uh, for the pricing. And um, honestly, the only way, that's the question that I've usually been asked is what is the best way to optimize the, uh, the Lambda? Is really doing doing an adequately low test of the function. And we constantly inspect the uh, metrics um, to be able to understand that where is, this, where is that sweet spot and set that memory for our application. But what we need to keep in mind is that if we have a function which is taking so long to finish or terminate, for instance, a report or a bad job, that first of all might not be a good candidate for Lambda. And second is that if it is, and we are still insisting to run it with the Lambda, then we need to start to break it down into multiple or several Lambdas, which are calling each other uh, async or async, regardless, but being able to break it down into multiple functions. So it costs less and it uh, runs more efficiently. Um, Finally, there are some Lambda limitations that we need to keep in mind in terms of uh, how much maximum memory is there. And um, uh, how much temporary disk which is available, which is built in there is 512 megabyte of memory, which is available there. And um, for, for a Lambda, we don't have the sticky session. So we need to keep that in mind when we're working with it. But each Lambda behind the scene running on, on how AWS is managing it is there is a temporary disk allocated to that. There are environment variables that we can use to be able to pass data between different Lambda functions. And finally, um, uh, there are CPU and memory allocated to that. So each instance, when you provision it, that goes over to, for the first invocation, actually, it goes up and it provisions that instance and, it's, and it stays in the pool. Um, so after a short period of time, it, if there is no more call to that, that uh, Lambda function or that instance would be shut down. But if you keep sending more requests in, that the same function might be executed if it's already been terminated. That's how the Lambda works behind the scene. And that's where you, you, you see that the, the performance is great and there is less cost involved with it because your function has already been warmed up and uh, you don't need to provision and, and reinstantiate the new Lambda functions. All right, so let's see how uh, we can invoke our Lambda. So we talked about our architecture. We talked about how uh, Lambdas are structured, how they're called now. The most important is that the invocation and how we can fit into our architecture. Basically, um, Lambdas are um, event triggered. Uh, there are different event sources that you can assign to your Lambda function. Uh, it can be anything. It can be changing in your data so the record has been inserted or or something has been updated. Um, it can be a request to an endpoint, an API uh, request coming from a HTTP, uh, sorry, coming, a HTTP request coming from an endpoint. Or even uh, any, any, any state has been changed for, your, for one of your resources. Let's say a file has been changed uh, in your S3 buckets or has been deleted or uh, many, many other cases. Now, those events would uh, trigger a function, the function built in any languages in my case, uh, which is my favorite, is .NET Core um, has been built on that. And then when your function is executed um, during the execution or your post -execution, execution, it can call any other service. For instance, your Lambda might call uh, an S3 bucket to write a file on it, or your Lambda might call, uh, send a message to the queue to be processed by the next Lambda, uh, or might write a record to the database or update it. There are different, different services. So basically, there are several um, f uh, AWS services they can be combined um, in both sides, either from the source or the target, can be combined and, and linked to the uh, Lambda functions. How we can, uh, this, this execution model, which is invoked by the, uh, any of those event sources, how they can be modeled, there are three different ways to do it. Uh, synchronous is what we uh, are the most very, 
are, are the most straightforward way to invoke your Lambda functions. And as you can see in this model, your function executes immediately when you perform the Lambda uh, um, invoke API call, and the caller should wait for the function to complete. That's the important part of part about a sync. So when you perform a synchronous invoke, you are responsible for checking the response and de determining if there was an error and if you should retry the invoke or not. And in this example, that's the um, uh, order endpoint that you call from the Amazon API gateway, which I'm going to cover it shortly. Then. Uh, you have async method. The async, uh, the Lambda exec executes on, on some event and caller doesn't wait for the function to complete. So there are some kind of messaging would be sent after that from different source. That means that the function has been completed. So if your function returns any error, the AWS is AWS will um, automatically uh, retry the invoke twice. And that's, that's how your um, uh, retry method would work. And of course, the, the last one is a stream or poll base, which you have a uh, set of source that sending the uh, stream of data. It can be, let's say, Amazon DynamoDB or, or Kinesis. That's the poll based invocation and allow you to integrate with those AWS um, stream and, and queue based services. Uh, with no code or server management. And Lambda will pull the, uh, those services on your behalf and retrieve records and, and invoke your functions. But what does the retry behavior look like for this model is um, it's based on a data expiration in a data source. If the data expired, um, that would call it again for, for to getting the new and fresh data from the sources. So these three are very important when you are, when you are um, uh, architecture in your application. You, you should start to think about which way I want to go or what kind of application do I have? If it's a stream, then the, definitely the, uh, the last option or third one is, is your, your candidate. But between sync and async, there are some uh, cons and pros that I'm going to cover uh, soon. Uh, but the favorite method is always async because we want to remove the dependency or, or decouple different part of application. Uh, but you know, sometimes synchronous um, is what we might go and end up with. Now, let's go to the um, actual um, architecture. Uh, so I'm going to now, using all of the concepts that, are, that we learned so far, I'm going to see how we can build our application. So typical application has a front and a back end. Um, so we have different uh, components that we need to put into those boxes. So first thing is that we want to send some, we want to intercept some requests. And those requests, which are coming requests, there are um, going to be some kind of API access. So what are the options available for, for your front end? There are three ways you can do it. You can use Amazon API Gateway or ALB or Load Balancer, or use the AWS um, AppSync. Now, let's, uh, let's learn more about them. So Amazon API Gateway, if you're familiar with that or not, this is um, a fully managed service, as you, can, as you know, that, that makes it easy for us to create, publish, and maintain, and even monitor and secure our APIs at any scale. Um, there are different API gateways uh, out there, uh, different frameworks, and, and Amazon API Gateway is just one of them. And it handles all of the tasks involved in accepting and processing up to hundreds and even thousands of, of concurrent API calls. And that includes the uh, traffic management, the core support, the authorization, access controls, and, and many other things. Um, there is no minimum fee or a startup cost with API Gateway. And it supports, as you can see here, the REST or so web, so uh, web socket support and uh, it has caching built in, open API support for, for documenting your APIs, and uh, it's paper request. Uh, so when you're setting up, there's no cost. When you're receiving a request, then that's where you get charged or for the data, amount of data that is transferred. So that's the first option. Now, the second one is using the application load balancer, which is best suited for load balancing of HTTP and HTTPS uh, traffics. And it provides you the uh, advanced request routing targeted at the delivery of uh, you know, modern application architectures, in, in including microservices and containers. And uh, that works at the request level, which is layer seven net of, of the network. Um, it allows the traffic to targets with Amazon uh, VPC based on the contents of the request. Now, again, it has some characteristics like the container support or, or paper per hour, which is different than API Gateway, um, but this is an option. Now, third one is AWS AppSync, which is uh, becoming the most, 
one of the most popular services of AWS and actually uh, simplifies the application development. It lets you to create a flexible API to to access and manipulate and combine the data from one or more data sources, transform the data, and uh, is managed service, and is based on GraphQL, um, and this makes it easy for applications to get the data that they want. So if you have an application that is accessing the data and pulling and showing an interface using some APIs, definitely AppSync is, is one of the options that you can go with it. Um, it has a deep integration with the Amplify framework, um, and I suggest that uh, do a bit of uh, study on the Amplify if you're not familiar with it. Um, and of course, it's pay per query and data transfer. So you see the different pricing options here. Now the question here is, based on those three, which one is actually uh, the option for me? Um, so here are some guidelines or chit chat. Uh, basically, if you have complex API, with different data sources and very unique queries, uh, then you need to combine some data, transform the data. I would suggest to go to the AppSync. If you have WebSockets, then Amazon API Gateway, or even for needing, you need to transform the data. Let's say you're receiving some uh, data in JSON format, then you want to transform it into different, another structure or XML format, let's say, then, then that's where you want to go to the Amazon API Gateway. It allows you to throttle up the, the, the uh, incoming request. Um, and uh, application load balancer is good for, for when you have a normal API and it's high request per month. And basically, there is no need to transform data. That's where we're going to so go with the ALB. And for any other cases, API Gateway is always there because that's the standard um, API management. So hopefully that gives you an idea about different options of setting up your front end, how you can compare, how you can come up with the right solution or right service for your application. Now, the question is that when we when we pick that service now, how, where where or how we should um, handle the, those request routings, and who is responsible for that? Let's say in in this example we have um, some APIs, users, products, and we're now we're thinking that okay, I'm sending an API gateway in front of it, and then there is AWS Lambda behind it. So shall I get the request in API gateway forward to, to Lambda? and then uh, leave the Lambda to decide what to do with this incoming request? Or no, everything should be done in API Gateway and, and, and the request to the Lambda should be fresh and clean with only the data that it needs. So here is example. Uh, the first option, do everything in API Gateway and leave the rest of the uh, Lambda functions just to, con to perform that specific function. In contrast, we have Amazon API Gateway sitting there to just send and route the traffic, but AWS Lambda is um, doing all of the management of the routing, deciding on what functions to run. So uh, think about it. It's, there is there is no um, rule of thumb for that. Um, it really depends on the taste and, and um, what, what actually the developers like. Um, uh, I personally like to put all of my codes behind AWS Lambda, but I, I always keep in mind that the Lambda is where I'm, I'm spending most of my money on it. So if it's costing me more, then I should remove the uh, additional burden of this Lambda function and leave it to somewhere else because that can execute faster. And if, for instance, if I want to scale up my, my products function or endpoint or Lambda, then I definitely don't want to have any extra bit in, added into that like the routing mechanism because that's not the core business logic that, that the Lambda function should cover. So there are different areas that you need to consider. And that also should give you a, a comparison between them. Um, you might want it to go with the API gateway, or you might do it in code. Uh, of course, with API gateway, you have better security uh, because it's all the built into API gateway and you can have fine grain um, security management in that layer. Better performance, of course, because it's would you scale up, and uh, uh, it's compatible with different AWS tools. If if you go into the AWS Lambda and or or different uh, services that AWS has, and you can integrate it to the gateway, then um, it might be a better option for you. But you know, for for AWS Lambda, uh, you get a better portability of code because your code has all the logics into that. As I said before, uh, it might not be a good option for always, but that's that. Uh, scenario. Um, you have the fewer security constructs um, in terms of IAM roles and policies that needs to build into the Lambda because it's already past the security layer. So 
honestly, it's a toss up, and and we see uh, very split feedbacks from from our customers. Uh, if you love your framework, stick with it. And if you don't, and you want to uh, do less and write less code, then go with the benefit of the managed services like Amazon API Gateway. So now the front end is, is kind of been solved. We know that what we need to do in there. Now let's go to the back end, your business logic. What needs to go there? Um, so imagine that your client is sending a post request to your service, and I call it order service here. So to, it's a synchronous API call, and you're receiving a 200, to, sorry, 201, and that means a successful operation. Um, so that's, that's how you get the response. Now, what if something's wrong on the server side? Well, you need to retry it again after the failure um, to be able to get the response back. Now, what if, the question is, what if we have that service is calling another service? Or in this example, you can think of actually uh, the Lambda function. So what if my orders uh, get or post order Lambda functions is actually posting to another Lambda functions? And we expect that to be synchronous call. Uh, so when the first one is completed, the second one can return the um, successful uh, message to the client. Now. If something go, goes wrong on the second function, then definitely uh, you will, you will uh, lose the chain and you won't get any response back. Now, the question is, um, who wants to retry and, and how long we have to keep retrying it? Um, how we can let the client know? Uh, so that's, that's where we, that's, that's the uh, situation that we try to stay away from it. Um, and that's, you know, it's, it's definitely a tight coupling. Um, and that's against the um, uh, best architecture uh, guidelines and design principles that we wanted to stay decoupled from different, between different services. So it's very hard to recover from that situation. Now, let's think um, async. So client uh, sent the first request to service A and the service B. Now in the synchronous method, as you can see in this picture, um, basically, they will have to wait for the response. Now, in the async, when you made a call to the first service, you don't wait for the second one to return. You immediately return and say, hey, your, your call has been successful because it means that your request has been successful. Then you have to wait on another thread or another uh, part of your application, uh, listen to the response from service B or service A, depends on how you return your response, um, to get that response back with either error or with the success. And that's um, how you, you, you see that you are decoupling those services from each other, regardless of what service B is doing. If it's failed or not, your service A has been completed and you can accept the next, the, the next incoming request. So this is um, the async model of, of, of our example. Um, we make the first call to the order and it goes to the invoice and then it returns the uh, images, returns 201 and then once uh, and you can make the next call. If you want to get another invoice, then um, if the function, the previous function has been completed, then you get would return 200. If it's a silly process to, to creating your invoice, then definitely you might return that uh, 404 or, or any kind of error that shows that the record has been created. So you've seen it a lot in, in the typical application that we, that we use it on our day-to-day -day basis. Let's say your, your Gmail or um, uh, your Google Drive, that's somewhere that you post the file and then you immediately want to access it, but it hasn't, the, pop, the upload hasn't been finished. So that's a very good example of async call. Now, to be able to support that uh, async architecture or async method, um, uh, there are different uh, AWS services that we can use. Um, you, you, you can use the uh, notification service or queuing service, event bridge or kinesis, depends on if you are using the, the data streams or not. So I'm not gonna cover deep into those services, but that's basically should give you different options. Uh, notification service is good when you wanna send a notification or propagate some message to other services you can use the SNS. If you, your incoming request can be queued up and wait for the next Lambda to pick it up, then the, the, the SQS is a good option for you. Event Bridge is kind of covering all of them. Uh, so uh, that's a very good uh, service to use as well. And uh, Kinesis, as I mentioned, that's for the data streaming. And it's very popular for streaming a video or streaming, a, uh, for instance, a Twitter feed that you are processing and is coming to your service constantly for the comments and posts. That's where you want to uh, integrate into that service. 
uh, how can you come up with the with the right um, series out of those four that I've mentioned? You can go to six categories and and compare those uh, against each other. Um, uh, how much uh, requests, how much concurrent requests you want to process? Uh, what is the consumption model? Uh, how durable your 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 uh, data? is if you want if you have something that's going to stay there for, for a short period of time and doesn't have any let's say the time out then the queuing might be a good option for you if you want to do multiple retries then you need to think about is is sqs the right option for me because you know depends on different method of uh, constructing the messages into the queue then um, your retry method, method would be different or how how well, what's, what's the order of receiving the messages that's another way of seeing it so with that, I'd like to show you the cheat sheet for it as well. Again, uh, massive throughput data, um, multiple consumers, uh, you want to replace something, then the Kinesis is the right option. Uh, let's say for SQS, um, you can buffer the requests un until they can be consumed, then SQS. And as you can see, event bridge is kind of covering everything else. So that can be an um, ideal option for majority of use cases that we have. All right, so we get to the point that now we have our backend structured, and it's going to be um, it's going to be my last slide on this topic because I think that's that's a good summary of what we discussed. You know, you you first start to uh, the journey for moving to the serverless is to breaking the area application from monolithic to to microservices. That's definitely the first step. I'm not saying that this is a must, but it's, it's the best thing that you, should, that you need to do. There, is, uh, there are other options, but definitely you not get the full benefit of the uh, serverless because your services are tightly coupled and you will get lots of problems down the track when you're re-architecturing your application. So you're breaking it down, then you will have your front and back end services, micro front and sitting in front, and then for each of them, then you start to think about, okay, my request is coming in, I want to intercept it with Amazon API Gateway as for this example, or any other service that can intercept it. And then I'm going to process and do all of the writings on that level, and then create more individual and simple and tiny functions that can be executed in the shortest possible time, and then that lambda functions need to output somewhere. It can send it to the um, uh, my my backend, or from the front end, I might immediately return some errors to the user. For instance, some data validation on the front end that, for instance, the password field is missing. And then in the back end, when I get my um, incoming events, which are actually the request, then I'm going to process it. Uh, depends on how long they can wait. It can be a queue. If I need to, let's say, the data streaming coming in, I might use the Kinesis, and then those would be uh, data would be ingested into the AWS Lambda. And that's where the core business logic is happening. An output would go through the database, storing a file on the system, or uploading or downloading a file, and finding the response. How I'm going to respond back to the front end. Is it sync or async? So, Hopefully, um, that gives you some uh, basic understanding about Lambda, how you can architecture your application, and where you should just start. And I, I leave some homeworks for you. Uh, concurrency is a very, very important topic. Uh, we have the uh, reserved and provision concurrency. Uh, I suggest you to go and uh, do a bit of homework on that. How does it work? How is it priced? Um, and what options are available out there for the concurrency? So with that, I'd like to finish my uh, presentation. Um, here are my contact details. Please get connected. If you have any more questions, I'm here to answer that. And thank you so much. Ron, back to you.